Hello, everyone. Welcome to the deep learning lecture today. It's actually the fifth lecture. And today we're going to talk about, or we continue to talk about how we do optimization um, of neural networks. In the previous lectures, we have already introduced the neural network, so we roughly know what they are, right? So a neural network, right, we have these layers. Um, we have an input layer, we have hidden layers, we have output layers. And these layers are connected. Um, they have these connections, these edges. They eventually are these weights that we want to optimize for. And each layer has a couple of neurons. And of course, we don't just have three layers for most neural networks. In practice, we have many, many hidden layers. And because of that, we also have a lot of um, connections here that are connecting the neurons between the layers. In this case, we have three hidden layers and we have an input and output layer. And you can already see um, it is becoming more and more complex, meaning that we have actually quite a few um, edge weights that later on we have to optimize for. Now, we also learned, well, we can abstract from the low level definitions of all of these neurons. We have the depth of the networks, which is the number of layers. We have the width of the network, which is the number of neurons per layer. Again, neurons can, can vary per layer, um, but often you also have architectures where you have a similar number of neurons per layer. And especially in the last lecture, we made this connection of compute graphs and neural networks, right? So we, we know now that we have these nodes in the compute graph where each of the node is um, some abstraction for a compute operation, like a multiplication with a weight, an addition, real activation and loss function and so on. So we can all write this down um, as a compute graph. We also discussed a lot about the loss functions, right? So if you're looking here on the left hand side, right, we see that here we're computing the loss between the predictions of y hat zero and y zero. Um, could be a regression loss, could be a classification loss and so on. And especially in the last lecture, we, we, we talked about how we compute the gradients here with respect to these Ws of the network. This is what we, um, what we are optimizing for. And well, of course, the neural networks, they become more complicated. In this case, we only have um, x0 and x1 as input. We have this loss function at the end, and we have kind of this one layer with its ReLU activation. Um, here we had this other example where we now have, um, well, we have two inputs again, x0, x1, but now we have three outputs at the same time. So we have y hat 0, y hat 1, and y hat 2. And yeah, and then we have a loss for each of these outputs. But again, we also want to compute the gradients with respect to all of the weights. Um, we talked a lot in the last lecture about how to compute the gradients in this case. So in this case, we are interested in the partial derivatives of the weights and the biases. So we want to optimize for these w's and we optimize for these b's, right? Um, and what we want to do is we take the loss function l, right? It's the sum of all of these output losses. Um, we compute the partial derivative of that function and then we do <clears throat> like this chain rule, the back propagation um, throughout the networks in order to get the gradients. And what we do, we get these gradients with respect to w and b. And Finally, once we have all these partial derivatives, we stack them all together and we're going to have our partial derivative, uh, our gradient um, of our function. And typically it's like that, right? So we have f here. Um, this is our neural network function. We have a training sample x and y. Um, we have the weights of the neural network w and we're computing it with respect to w. And then we, again, what's very important here, if we stack all of these um, partial derivatives into a vector, if you're looking at the indices here, we have here three indices for the weights, right? Zero, zero, zero means it's the zeroth layer, the zeroth neuron in that layer, and this is the zeroth input weight. So it's L, M, and N, right? Layer, neuron, and which weight in the neuron. Um, we also have the biases. We see the biases B, their partial derivatives. Um, we only have one B per neuron. Um, so we only have two indices here. Again, this is the layer. This is which neuron it is. Um, yeah, and then what we can do is we can have this compute graph structure. So we have this directional graph. We have it divided into, into layers, and then we can do back propagation in order to compute this vector. Once we have computed the vector, we do gradient descent. And this is um, where we stopped in the last lecture. Um, so once we have computed that, right, we can do this gradient uh, update steps in order to update the current number of weights. In this case, 
we want to continue the discussion here. We want to figure out how does the optimization um, actually work in practice. And there's a few details which we, we haven't discussed yet. And this is what we're going to do today um, in this lecture. So we discussed already that we have um, a gradient descent optimization, right? So we see we have this initialization here. And then what we do is we want to follow the negative gradient. So we want to descend on, on the function in order to find the minimum. Now, the function f here is a neural network, right? Um, x is whatever we're optimizing for in this case, in this case, the, the parameters um, and the biases. And well, the gradient is of course defined as, um, as the, uh, if, you, if you look at the uh, extremum uh, at the limit here, right? Uh, we're just checking for very small h here, like what is the slope here of this function, right? Um, so we have x, f, x plus h and x and h we're just going to let go to zero and we have this um, differential operator that we're getting and that computes us um, the partial derivative um, the gradient here um, for that function. Okay, um, we follow the derivative until we are at the minimum. We iteratively do this, right? So um, we do this a couple of times. The gradient um, in practice, we went through this in the last lecture, points in the positive direction just for, for for the definition reasons, this is how analytic um, derivatives are being defined. Um, and then simply we follow the direction of the greatest, uh, negative greatest gradient here, right? Okay, um, yeah, so the gradient steps go in the negative direction. We have the learning rate, and the learning rate is this very important parameter um, that we're following. Um, and we can scale that parameter, right? We can say if we have a small learning rate, we're gonna make small steps. Um, and if we're having a bigger learning rate, we can make bigger steps here, right? Um, so that's basically how our, our learning rate or our gradient step size controls how quickly we, we are descending here. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so one big thing about gradient descent here is if we initialize this function here, right? So we have some initial value. Um, that's always what we need to do. Um, we're going to have later a bit of discussion how we initialize it. Um, the question is, uh, when do we reach this point, right? How do we know that it's this point here, right? And that is something that is, is actually a good question because basically we want to know when we're done with the optimization. And in this case, what we're doing is we, we, we literally just check, oh, is there a gradient, right? If the gradient is non-zero, then we know, oh, there's a slope and we can follow the slope. And eventually this gradient here will become zero if we converge, right? Or will be close to zero. Um, and then we know we reached it. And that's whenever we're talking about optimization, what we want to do is we want to find, um, yeah, we want to, want to find a parameter value where our function um, has a zero gradient, right? Then, then we're done and we, we found what we're looking for. Um, question is, is it, the, is it really what we're looking for? Because this point is obviously not the lowest point. It's not the best optimum. Um, and the problem what we have in practice is we're not guaranteed to reach the global optimum, right? In this case, we're having this, this function here that reaches a local minimum here. It has another local minimum here and it has a global minimum here. Um, gradient descent has absolutely no guarantee um, that we do reach the global optimum. And that may or may not be a problem. We're going to talk about this one a little bit more in the, in the next lecture. Um, there's some intuition behind neural networks that finding maybe this point here is good enough. And um, this is one of the reasons why people think neural networks work relatively well, because we have a higher dimensional function we're optimizing and kind of all local minima might be okay-ish. But again, if you're just looking at the theory of gradient descent, there's absolutely no guarantee that we did find the right optimum. Um, are there conditions when we have the global optimum here? Um, and there's a special type of functions and these functions are convex functions, right? Um, in the case of a convex function, we know that all local minima are actually global minima. Um, what's the definition of uh, a convex function? Well, if we have this, this curve here, right? And if we have an arbitrary line um, that we are intersecting through, um, that this line plane segment between any two points lies above or on the graph, right? Basically, we only have, we only have these two intersection points here, right? So in this case, we know it's a convex function. In this case, we can guarantee that 
if we do converge to a local optimum, that it is also the global optimum, because that's the definition of, of the convex function. Now, in practice, I already mentioned it. In practice, we will very quickly see that neural networks are actually non-convex, right? I mean, this, this is just how it goes um, by, by stacking layer by layer with non-linearities um, on it. Um, that makes the function non-convex. Now, that is good from a, from a you know, capacity and, and, and complexity standpoint when you want to explain the training data, but it makes the optimization, of course, a lot harder. Because in this case, you know, we have many, many local optima. We have many, many local optima in this function. Um, in fact, right, if you have like millions of parameters, we might even have millions of local optima. Um, that's just how it goes. And the challenging thing is we don't know based on the optimization result whether we did reach a local or actually the global optimum, right? Um, well, we can figure it out when we compute all of them, but if you have, again, millions of optima, then, then it's very tricky to, 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 there's no practical way to, to say which one is global um, because we would have to guarantee that we computed literally all of them, right? If you have a, a polynomial function, you can just compute all, um, you can just compute all extreme values, extreme values, and then you know that which one is the best one or which one is the lowest one, right? Um, but in practice, if you have a very high, higher order function, like a neural network, it's, it's very difficult to find all of them. So in practice, we just don't know. So this is one of the problems uh, with neural networks. But again, I already mentioned, like, we might be okay with finding a local minima. This might be okay for many, many cases. It might not be, you know, the perfect, um, the perfect solution, but it might be a good enough solution. And we'll later see what this practically means in terms of um, generalization and, and learning performance. Another thing that's pretty important is not just which local minima we're finding, but also if we're finding it at all. So basically, what about the convergence itself? Like, do we converge or not? And I already mentioned the learning rate is a pretty big factor here. So we have to consider making smaller versus making bigger steps. So if we're having this function here, again, this is a, it's a simple uh, convex function here. Uh, it's actually a, a parabola. Um, in this case, if our learning rate is too big, what it means is if we're starting from here, we want to make a step into this direction. But if this step is too big, we end up accidentally here. And then we're looking here, the gradient would point down here. If you're pointing too much, we end up here and so on, right? So what you might hap have happen is if your learning rate is too big, you might have this issue that you're never going to reach this point here in the middle because we're always overshooting. And this is a problem we will often see in neural networks also. If the learning rates are too big, then you're not going to converge to a good solution. I mean, often you even don't converge at all. You just, you just diverge because you're always overshooting. And, you know, the further you go away from your minimum, um, the larger the gradients get. And because you're making a large step size, you already, you, you're going even further away, right? So th this might be a problem if the learning rate here is too big. We might accidentally uh, never reach this local minimum. And we just might, might do many, many, many jumps here. Um, on the other hand, we have maybe the scenario where we have a too small learning rate. Um, then we're going into the right direction, but we do need a lot of steps. And you could argue, well, it might not be just a big issue. Then we just train a little bit longer or we optimize a little bit longer on our networks. But if you sometimes have like optimization times of two weeks and the learning rate is too small and we have like a factor of 10 too, too slow of a convergence, that actually counts pretty much uh, that we have suddenly 20 weeks, right? So like these things um, are very, very very important that we find the good balance between the learning rate. On one hand, we want to have a large enough learning rate to make good progress. On the other hand, we want to make sure that we're not overshooting accidentally. So that's a very, very important um, concept of gradient descent. And we're going to talk about this one again in more detail, but I, I just want you to understand what happens um, uh, like in this overshooting or in this like too small learning rate steps. Yeah. Um, if you're looking at sometimes a bit more complicated functions, you might end up with functions like these. Um, and just for the for the terminology here, I wanted to introduce this quickly. So we have here this function, right? It goes down, goes up, goes down, it goes up, and then it plateaus here. So we already introduced this concept of a local minimum. We have the concept of a global minimum. And also what's very important to consider are these plateauish regions. These are regions where, you know, the function is kind of plateauing. It has a very, very small gradient either up, either down, um, but it's a very small gradient. And in this case, you're actually making very, very small steps in gradient descent, right? Because your gradient is pretty small. Um, 
And, and that is very tricky also for optimization because in these cases, um, you need a lot of optimization steps to get out of these plateau regions. Um, in practice, what you would want to do is you want to increase the learning rate, but if the learning rate again becomes too big and now we're already here, we might accidentally overshoot again. So this is a, a, very, a very interesting problem statement, right? And yeah, so, so that's the things kind of to consider when doing gradient descent. Um, in this case, all of these curves that I have just shown you, um, they're all gonna, gonna be in 2D, right? So we, we had gradient is equal to the derivative here, um, but in practice, we're gonna go to higher dimensions, um, in particular for neural networks, right? Again, we mentioned it might have millions and millions of, of, of weights in our neural network that we have to optimize for, so our dimensionality becomes quite high. Um, often in, in two dimensions, you see visualizations like these ones. Um, there's various ways to visualize it. These ones are with isolines, so you have here, you know, every isoline denotes a certain function value. Um, we have here um, x0 starts here, right? And basically what you're doing now is you just compute the gradients, which is the orthogonal line um, to the iso values. That's by definition on the iso plot, um, the gradient, right? And, and then we're just gonna follow step by step our gradients here in these uh, two dimensions until we reach hopefully our, our minimum. Um, yeah, you often see visualizations that look like these, right? Often the gradient doesn't quite go straight all the way here. Sometimes it chitters a little bit around. Um, yeah, this is maybe not the, it's not mathematically correct how I drew the arrows here, um, but but often you see that you don't have like this nicely shaped function. So you, you often like chitter a little bit around. And the reason why you see that here is because we have, here we have an ellipsoid uh, shaped energy landscape. And in this case, you can already see that we're not making like you know, uh, we, we have very high gradients in these directions, so that's why you often get these, these chittering artifacts. Um, yeah, these are typical visualizations for gradients in 2D. We can go, you know, another, uh, uh, another dimension higher when you plot it. Um, in this plot here, we have here two parameters, theta zero and theta one. Uh, we have here the function value, in this case it's called J, but it's just a standard function, right? So the actual function value is the z-axis. Um, and x and y here are theta zero and theta one. Um, yeah, and here we have red is high, blue is low, right? And hopefully we go through this path here into, into this value. Oh, you already see we have two local minima here. One is here and one is here. I don't know which one is lower. It might also not be the only one depending on the size of the function um, or the complexity of the function. Um, but this is also a very good way to visualize it. Um, and this is something for you that might be interesting when you're first playing around with different optimization methods. You know, don't do it first on like a large neural network, but just visualize like your gradient descent variations here uh, on cases like these ones. But yeah, let's go back to neural networks. Um, I wanted to actually walk you through a little bit um, how, to, how to apply gradient descent here in practice, because um, it turns out like scaling it up to large neural networks becomes, um, becomes pretty complicated still. Um, but what we have right now is, right, we have this input layer, we have a hidden layer and an output layer. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we have the neurons for, for, each, uh, for each layer. We have the connections between the neurons. These are the weights we're optimizing for. Um, we have the biases and we have the loss function, right? So here are our two, the, the definitions of the layers. Here's our simple uh, ReLU maximum function that we going to discuss, uh, that we discussed already. Um, here we, we have our gradient vector, again, note the three indices, I'm going to repeat it, L, M, and N, layer, which neuron, and which weight, layer, which neuron, um, we're computing the gradients, um, and now let's see how we do optimization. So if we're going to train a neural network, how we're starting is with our training set, and uh, we have a loss function L, we have a, we have a training sample um, X, I, and Y, I. And for simplicity, I just want to say, well, we have a single training sample, not, not, not like a whole training set. I just want to have a single training sample, let's say X is an image and Y, y is some sort of label. And the idea is based on the single training sample, we want to find the best model parameters theta, which include both weights and biases, um, such that we minimize our loss function, right? So our loss function should be minimized in a sense that we're optimizing for theta, and we want to best possibly explain our training sample x i y i. Right? That's all we can do. Based on this training sample, we want to find the optimal theta. So how we do it in practice is we initialize theta. We have 
for right now, let's say we have a random initialization. We will later talk a little bit about good strategies for optimization. Uh, in this case, uh, we just use random values, but we will talk more about this one later. And what we do is we have theta one with random values. And then what we do is we iterate. So, you know, we, we compute the gradient at theta k, again, given that training sample, um, and we update theta k and get theta k plus one. So we start with theta one, we have theta two, theta three, and so on until they end up with theta k. Um, and we do this until we converge, and convergence means that our parameters here, they don't change anymore. This is kind of the definition um, of convergence, right? So we compute the gradient, we then update that step, didn't, didn't change anymore. And yeah, let's have a look at the, at the dimensionality. So again, here we, we have our simple gradient descent update step. And what do we do? Well, we compute this, this gradient here with backpropagation. We went through this, right? We have our compute graph. So we're optimizing for, for these parameter values. Uh, for, the, for the partial derivatives here, we're getting the gradient. We have the learning rate. That's our hyperparameter. And these ones are typically randomly initialized, right? Again, we have here the weights and biases after the update step. We have here the weights and biases at step k of the current model. Um, we have the learning rate and we have the gradient with respect to theta. Um, typically, what I mentioned now in terms of dimensionality, oh yeah, we have, of course, we have our loss function. Um, what I mentioned in terms of dimensionality, we will see very, very quickly that the dimensionality of the gradient can be pretty big because that's based on the number of parameters of the learnable parameters we have in our neural network. And I mentioned we also, yeah, we have possibly millions of these parameters. So this, this vector here can be, can be pretty high. Um, Yeah, let's see what what does it mean if, if if this if this gradient is high dimensional well doing an update step costs you pretty much a full loop over all of the parameters but the really costly thing is actually computing this this gradient here this is where most of the compute comes into play um, we'll later talk about this a bit but basically one gradient step means i have to basically have a for loop over all my parameters over all my layers right i need to go through all the layers backwards and check parameter by parameter so that's the, that's the costly part here. Uh, and that's later on something we're gonna do very efficiently in GPU frameworks and can parallelize so and so on. Okay, and these are our training samples, xi and yi. Um, again, we're not optimizing for these. They are just given to us based on the training set and all we can do, we can optimize for the thetas given this training sample. Now, this one was done using a single training sample. But I mentioned, of course, in practice, we have many, many training samples in the training set. And we need those because we can quickly see, well, our dimensionality of theta here is greater than 1 million for many cases, or can be greater than 1 million for many cases. We will very quickly see that constraining this problem only by one training sample is less ideal, right? So you can't do that, but all you're gonna do is you're gonna memorize whatever this training sample would do. You're just gonna memorize the class here. Now, if we do multiple training samples, what is going to change? Now, we still have a loss function L, but we have multiple, in this case, n training samples, x, i, y, i. We still have the, the model parameters theta. The dimensionality here didn't change. Our model is still the same. We still have our weights and our biases. Our cost function changed now. Our cost function goes over one training sample, right? and just sums up the results from all the loss functions for every training sample. So in practice, what do you do? Um, you have this loop from i to n, and we have n training samples, you sum up the loss, and this one gives you the, the total loss what you want to optimize for, right? So our optimization changed now slightly. Um, we still wanna find theta, but we wanna do it with respect to the global loss that respects all training samples. There's one thing, what, I'm, what I've written here, this one over n, um, often people are lazy, and don't write that one down, um, this one over n. This is one thing, uh, yeah, that I'll get to in a second. Often people are lazy about this. Um, but what we do now is we do an update step for multiple samples, meaning now we compute the gradient with respect to the loss function, sorry, with respect to theta of the loss function. And now we do it with respect to one to n, right? So we have n training samples here. So it's x from one to n and y from one to n. 
And the gradient then is the average over the sum of residuals by simply, if I'm going back here quickly, I'm taking this cost function, I'm just computing the gradient for each training sample for each loss. Right? So that means we have this loop that goes over the training samples here. Um, we're summing up the part, the, the gradients for each for each training sample independently, right? And we're gonna get the average over all of the gradients, which makes sense, right? It's just all I've been doing is like I have the gradient operator on L, and then you know I I just get the the gradients of each individual loss function, where each loss function represents one training sample, right? So that's all what I'm doing here. Uh, and again, this one comes from back propagation. Now, this one you can already see we have quite some compute effort here. Now we have to go over this n, right? Depending how many training samples we have, and this one here has to go again over all the over all the partial derivatives in the network, meaning that it has to go from the right to the left in the computer graph. I mentioned this right. Often people are lazy and um, don't write this one over n. This counts here for the loss function, what I mentioned here. Uh, the same thing counts here for the gradient. Um, if you do that, if you omit this 1 over n, the implication is, I mean, this is just a scalar, right? So basically, changing 1 over n means just changing the learning rate. The reason why you want to have this 1 over n here is you want to make your update steps independent of how big your training set is, right? So if my training set is basically 10 times as big, I still want to do roughly the same speed of updates than if it was a smaller training set. So you want to normalize with respect to the number of residuals that you're using. Um, again, often people don't write it down. In practice, it doesn't change the formulation, except it just means rescaling the learning rate. But you don't want to like find a new learning rate for every training set size. So in practice, you want to find a hyperparameter that is with respect to the normalized gradient. I don't know if this is a good term, but it's basically with this one over n normalization. Okay, there's also a way to find a good learning rate, actually. There's actually even a way to find the optimal learning rate. So what we can do here is we compute the gradient, right? And we can optimize for an optimal step alpha. In other words, what we can do is we can check the loss function. We have our current parameter values, theta k. We have our gradient at theta k. And we want to figure out what is the alpha where loss becomes minimal given this gradient, right? So this is kind of optimizing, give me a gradient, tell me how far do I have to step to get the minimal value of the function, and then do the update step. Um, and this is a line search method, which is actually very well known in, in optimization methods. Um, this gives you the perfect step size. And that's good, because theoretically now we know how far we have to go, but on the other hand, it's also pretty complicated because we need to solve this linear system, or we need to solve a huge system um, it depends if it's linear or not. It depends on the problem. In practice, it's nonlinear. Um, but the issue here is that basically this is a huge system and we have to solve the system every step. Often you can use linear approximations and stuff like that. Um, but nonetheless, for neural networks, this is unfortunately too complicated mostly. So this is why people rarely do it. I, I still wanted to mention it because um, people often ask me, well, you can figure out the learning rate by just optimizing for it, right? And I say, yeah, you can, but it, it's very complicated when you have um, we have some linear approximation here. <laughs> Even then, you have to solve a linear system with like millions of parameters. Okay. Um, yeah, if you're going back to our to our training here, in this case, if we do training, we train with a large training set because we also have typically millions of parameters in, in the model. Um, in this case, let's have a simple example. Let's say we have a training uh, set of n training samples of x i y i. Let's say we have 1 million labeled images. Um, that's our training set size. And we have a network has 500k parameters. It's a bit of a smaller network. Um, often you, you see that you know, there's like a relationship. You typically have a few more training samples um, than you have parameters in order to overconstrain it enough. What does it mean? Well, in this case, I have 500k parameters. That means the gradient is 500k dimensional. Um, we also know n here. This is because we have 1 million labeled images. This is basically um, 1 million, right? So in this case, if we want to compute the gradient, we will very quickly see this is expensive to compute. Again, if I'm going back, we have to go over this loop here. 
over all the 1 million training samples, over all the 500k parameters here, and compute the gradient, right? So this is expensive to compute. This is one reason um, why if you're doing naive gradient descent, um, it might be pretty slow. And there might be an issue in, in figuring out what the gradients are because you know you figure it out eventually and then you do one step and then you have to recompute it again. So basically we need, since we need many steps, <laughs> um, this is actually uh, in practice a very, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's practice, it's just a bit of a too expensive strategy. So what do we do? How can we basically, like how can we figure out how to make this faster? And well, we have two numbers here where we can compromise. Uh, the number of parameters, we can make the model smaller. Well, we could do that, but then the model wouldn't be so good anymore. Uh, we could compromise on the training set. Um, well, we don't want to do that either, right? Our training set is going to be still pretty big. Um, but there's one thing we can compromise on, meaning it's how to compute the gradient for one update step. And this is what stochastic gradient descent is doing. This is SGD. And the idea is instead of taking the entirety of the training set to compute the gradient, I'm just going to take a random subset. Right? So again, if we have n training samples, we need to compute the gradient for all of them, which is O of n. But what we can assume is that we can approximate the gradient, the gradient of all of the training samples with a subset, um, with a subset basically, right? So we can assume this is an expectation of the gradient and that one can be approximated with a subset of the training samples. And this is what SGD is doing and the way it works is pretty straightforward. Um, what we do is we take a subset of the data. So we take a random subset. Um, this is what we call a mini batch. And we take this random subset um, in order to approximate the gradient um, or the loss basically for the entirety of our training set. Um, and we just take this random subset here, right? And the idea is that this random subset M is significantly smaller than N, smaller than N. Uh, I'll give you a, a few numbers here how we typically do this, um, but essentially what we do is we now have our entirety of, this is um, our entirety of the training set basically, and we divide this into batches. And these mini batches, here's one mini batch, right? This mini batch here um, goes from X1 to XM, right? This is M is a subset of our training set. And then what we do is the entirety of the training set is B1, B2 until B, N divided by M, right? So N is the total number of the training set and M is the current batch. Again, look at the indices. I'm always trying to look at the indices because then I know roughly what my dimensionality um, is and I know roughly what to expect. Okay, so this, this mini batch size is a hyperparameter. In practice, you will often see this hyperparameter to be a power of two. Um, there's a reason for it and that's mostly because it's how to efficiently map it to the GPU. We'll talk about this a little bit, but basically what you have to assume here is if we're having a smaller mini batch size, then we're getting noisier gradients because we're only considering a very, very small subset of the data. If we're taking a big batch size, then we're getting better gradient estimates, right? The extreme case is we take the entirety of the training set. So we set mini batch size to training set. That's the extreme case. Then we just have gradient descent. Then we're getting a perfect estimate of the gradient because we're taking all training samples, but then it's slow. So it's gonna be, this mini batch size is essentially a trade-off between how fast can you compute the, the current gradient, how fast can you estimate it, and how accurate is it gonna be, how noisy is it. So in practice, I mentioned already, typically it's a power of two. For most cases, it's something between eight and 128 or something like that. This, these are reasonable sizes, what you often see. In practice, this number, is lower than you wanted to have it, right? In practice, you, you probably want to have this number a bit bigger, but you also, almost in every case, we limit by GPU memory. And this is what happens in the backward pass. So let's say the training set has two to the power of 20 images, right? It's about 1 million. Um, and a typical scenario is we have a mini batch size of 64. So now we divide 1 million by 64, then we get about 16,000 mini batches here, right? This is like um, one to 16,000 mini batches. Um, and yeah, we, we basically uh, can compute a gradient, 
a single gradient step after every mini batch. And that's very easy because we only have to go over 64 training samples. Again, these 64 samples are considered to be representative for the entirety of the training set. Um, but of course they're not, but we still want to use all of them. And what we do is like every time we do an iteration, we, we're going we're gonna to change this random subset. In practice, what you do is you pre-compute this actually. So you take your training set, you divide it into mini batches, um, and you iterate. And um, this, this association of randomness is kind of predetermined. And then once you're training, it's actually fixed. Um, there's this notion of an epoch. An epoch means we have gone through all of the training samples once. So in this case, it would be after 16,000 mini batch iterations here. And there's the concept of an iteration. That's what's happening whenever we do one gradient update step. So it's an iteration and there's an epoch. These are two, two important concepts. Okay. Well, how does it look like in practice? Well, in, in mathematically, if you write it down, we have, again, our initial model here, right? Uh, theta k. We have our learning rate here. We have our gradient um, of theta of L. But now this one is an estimate by just taking one mini batch here. This one to m is one mini batch, right? Uh, in this case, of course, the kth iteration. Um, gradients computed exactly the same way um, as before, except instead of m here, we have a, uh, instead of n, we have an m. Um, we normalize it again, so we have m training samples in the current mini batch, and this one is the gradient of the kth mini batch right now. Um, yeah, and then what we do is we compute the gradient of this mini batch, we do one update, and then we continue and so on. Um, again, the terminology here is important iteration with this epoch. Iteration means after every mini batch, we do one iteration, we do one gradient update step, and after every epoch, we have seen all the training samples. When we're through with all of them, we just start over again, right? So we still want to see every training sample probably multiple times. Um, depends on the, on the problem, but it's very likely you see like hundreds of epochs that you need for training, right? That's not like, oh, you went through it once, you're done. No, no, you have to iterate maybe many, many, many times, right? Okay, um, so the convergence here is a little bit different now. Um, this is something we have to talk about. Um, suppose we, we want to minimize the function f of theta with this stochastic approximation, right? Um, we can assume we have here a learning rate, right? And this learning rate goes from, you know, this, this, this might be a sequence of positive step sizes. So we have alpha one, alpha two to alpha n. Uh, this h here is an unbiased estimate of the gradient. This is essentially what we do with gradient descent. Um, so we assume these ones are uh, is the estimate here that is pretty good and now we can actually they can you can actually mathematically prove when SGD converges and when it doesn't converge again I'm talking about convergence I'm not talking about finding a global optimum I'm talking about finding anything that that is converged and there's this thing called Robbins Monroe condition and this is what I'm um, I put on the slide here so the convergent this Iteration, iterative scheme here, again, with a, with a positive sequence of learning rates. You don't want to go in negative direction. You always want to go positive. Um, and here's our estimate of our, of our gradient. Um, this converges to a local minimum if the following conditions are met. So the learning rates have to be positive. That's already going to be established. Um, and, well, n is greater than zero. This kind of makes all the sense, right? Um, and these two things are important here. So the sum of all the learning rate steps goes to infinity, but the sum of the squared learning rate steps in the limit is less than infinity. So this converges to some sort of fixed value that is smaller than infinity. So if these things are, are fulfilled here, then we know that gradient, that SGD will converge. Well, we know it's a global optimum also if this is a strictly convex function. Again, this is maybe for neural networks, it's not so interesting. Um, but for the theory of, of, of SGD, um, it is an interesting node, of course, right? And yeah, this is this Robbins Monroe condition. And you can actually prove that, that this is the case. So I would encourage you, if you have some time, look up the research paper behind it and check out why that is the case. It's actually not too complicated. Um, I don't want to go into that detail here, but I think what's important right now is uh, 
that we can prove that it converges under these conditions. Yeah, this is basically STD. Um, we know that it converges. Um, it's actually the standard method what we use for neural networks right now. So this is why we're mentioning it. This is what we're going to use right now for the following um, iterations uh, of, of the lecture. Um, there are, however, a few problems of SGD. There's two problems, basically, I think. So one problem is the gradient is scaled equally across all dimensions. So if you're going a one-dimensional function, that doesn't matter. But if you have a higher dimensional function, the gradient cannot be scaled independently for each dimension. Let's say we have a high gradient in one direction, we want to make bigger steps there, um, and we want to increase the learning rate possibly because we know we're going down further there. Um, that would be nice, but we can't do that because our learning rate is a scalar. So we have to be conservative and choose a minimum learning rate in, in order to avoid conversion, uh, divergence. Um, and so, well, in order to make sure it doesn't diverge, uh, we are slower than necessary. So that is, that is obviously a problem, right? Uh, and the second thing is, I mentioned this also a couple of times, finding a good learning rate is an art by itself. We will talk about this in detail in the next lecture, but um, I already mentioned like doing things like, you know, line search optimization is a bit, is a bit iffy, right? I mean, we, we probably can't do this in practice because we just have too many parameters. But I wanted to talk a little bit about this problem here. I wanted to talk about this. Why is this a problem that the gradients are actually scaled equally with respect to the learning rate? Um, and one, one remedy to address here is we can use momentum. And I wanted to quickly introduce the concept of momentum here. So if we're having an ellipsoid-like shaped energy landscape, again, we have here the isolines, this is the optimum in the middle, and you know, the further you go away from that, the higher the energy values. Um, what we would love to do is, we would love to go faster in this direction to the minimum, right? Because we want to reach it faster. And we want to go smaller steps here in these directions because they're just going back and forth, right? These steps, like if you're just taking the, the magnitude, you go back up and forth here, um, is kind of a disaster, right? So especially in these ellipsoid-like shapes, you're going to see, well, the gradient is going to point upwards here. Now it's going to point downwards, now it's going to go upwards. Why does it do that? Well, it's ellipsoid, right? The gradient is just very high in these directions. But because we can't scale it with the learning rate respectively, that is an issue. So ideally, um, well, we're making many, many steps back and forth basically here. Um, and we would not like to do that, right? We would like to make smaller steps in these directions and larger steps in these directions. So we want to dampen things basically in this and we want to accelerate in this direction. And the idea behind momentum is we wanted to accumulate gradients over, the, over time, right? We just don't want to do a gradient based on the last step. We want to take the history of gradients that we have observed over the last n iterations. And this is gradient descent with momentum. Um, the formula is now a little bit adapted. So we have two update rules. It's not just gradient descent anymore. In fact, what we do is we have here the gradient of the function. This one is our gradient. Um, we have our learning rate. And we have a velocity that is basically updated based on the history of gradients, right? If you're just checking this formula here, um, this one is doing nothing else but the velocity is the previous velocity plus the gradient, right? That's all we're doing here. We're just updating, just checking out what the velocity is over time. So if, in other words, if, if the gradient points always in the same direction, this value here will grow. If the gradient will go up and down, this value will be roughly the same around zero, right? Because, you know, we don't accumulate this velocity. Um, so in other words, this is an exponential weighted average of the gradients, um, right? Like this is an exponential weighted average. And the important thing is here, this velocity is a vector valued function. So we are doing this on a per component or a per, per partial derivative basis um, uh, in, in order to accumulate the gradients for each dimension. Um, and then what we do is instead of using the gradient for the update of the parameters, we actually update it with respect to that velocity, right? Um, what does it mean? Well, if we have basically now a gradient that always points in one direction, then we will make larger update steps there. If a gradient points up and down, then we will make smaller update steps there. Um, 
yeah, the, the beta here is an accumulation rate. This is a hyperparameter we have to check. Um, this hyperparameter tells us how, do, how quickly do we accumulate this exponential average. We have the learning rate, the one I mentioned, we have the velocity, we have the gradient of the current mini batch. Again, this is again, this is always now a mini batch. Everything is going to be mini batch based. So anything we're going to be doing here is going to be a variation of uh, gradient uh, of, of SGD. So these are SGD variations now, what we're going to discuss. Again, we have here the weights of the parameters, uh, the, the weights of the model, um, previous ones, next ones, and here's the velocity. Now, well, now the idea is essentially, right, if the gradient, we can kind of accelerate. So we have this acceleration um, value. Okay, so um, if you are drawing this quickly, right, what we can see is the step will be the largest when a sequence of grains all point in the same direction. And in other words, we're accumulating, like if you have an ellipsoid shape here, right, at the beginning we will chitter, but eventually we won't chitter anymore. You see it here, right? This one doesn't chitter anymore. It goes back and forth at the beginning, but then later on it doesn't do that anymore. Um, why? Because the velocity tells us, oh, go faster this direction, and here the back and forth is kind of averaging out. So velocity will very high into this direction, very small in this direction. Um, yeah, there's one drawback what we're doing what we're doing right now is we basically have two hyperparameters. So I already mentioned like alpha is complicated to find. This is learning rate. Um, we have a beta now. This this, this, this yeah. If we're going back quickly, um, yeah. If we're going back quickly here, we have the exponential. Uh, we, we have this uh, this friction rate, this accumulation rate. This tells us how quickly we should accumulate uh, the gradients. Um, by the way, if we're setting beta to zero, we're having naive gradient descent, right? If this one is zero, this one will be just always the current gradient, and then we're just doing gradient descent. So this is kind of interpolating between accumulate all the gradients between, um, oh yeah, and if beta is pretty big, then we're gonna have this issue, we only care about the previous gradients, but not about whatever is there. If we're setting this too high, um, then um, we, we, we're not adapting to the function quickly enough. So we're ignoring the current value. So we're basically overshooting massively and the gradient tells us already, don't go anymore, don't go anymore. And then uh, we're gonna go even further because uh, we are, we're overshooting too much. So too much momentum is also bad, right? So we need a break eventually, <laughs> we need a break. Okay, um, yeah, in practice, um, everybody uses beta set to 0.9. <laughs> this is just a hyperparameter that everybody uses. Um, if you don't have to, if you don't have really good reasons, I would not change that parameter, right? And yeah, so we all, we still have to figure out alpha, but beta is typically set to 0.9. Um, yeah, so let's have a look at the optimization. Another question is, can it overcome local minima? And well, let's say again, we have our, our, our great function here, right? We have our initial value. Um, the big question right now is, well, do we end up here? Do we end up here? Do we end up here and here? And um, which I have done now with a great PowerPoint animation, we will see we can. And it goes down and we have momentum and it goes to the next local minima. And I think that's pretty exciting. And if we had more momentum, it probably would have made it over there. And because this was so nice, I want to show it again, right? We have this, it goes down, builds up momentum and it goes to the next one. Um, yeah, so this is actually, it's a pretty straightforward idea. Um, I'm not arguing here that overcoming this local minima is a good idea. In this specific case, we're actually going to a higher energy state here. Um, in practice, momentum is not necessarily the idea of, oh, we're overcoming local minima and we're getting better results. Momentum is really a thing. We want to do it because otherwise we're going to be too slow. This is mostly for speed reasons. Um, there's a lot of variations of momentum. Um, I, I'm not going to go over all of them, but the idea of building and accumulating up gradients is shared by all of these. There's just different ways of how to accumulate and build up these momentums, right? And a specific example of what, what many people have been using is nest drop momentum. Um, it's kind of, it's an idea of, it's called look ahead momentum. So the idea is, well, we're taking the parameters data, we just taking the velocity we've built up in the previous steps, and we just make the step. So we're just going to do, we're just going to take the previous gradient and we use that step, right? So if we want to make this update here, 
um, we're going to get to some parameter value theta tilde k plus 1. Right? We're going to get some update step that is somewhere in between. Um, but now we, we want to we correct this one, this value we want to correct based on the current gradient. But instead of computing the gradient at theta k, we're going to compute the gradient already at this look ahead value. Right? We're going to compute it at theta tilde. This is already, we made one step and now we're basically one step ahead um, to compute the gradient. And then we're doing the same momentum update we did before. Uh, we have the velocity of the previous velocity and we're updating with, with, the current, with the current gradient we got. And then we're going to do an update of the parameters. Now, the idea of this is, the idea is that computing the gradient here at the next look ahead step gives us a better gradient than if we had computed it as theta k, right? That's the idea behind it. Um, again, to visualize it again is, um, first we're making this big jump here, right? Then we check where the gradient, what was wrong, we make this correction value and we end up in the green line. This is the accumulate gradient now, right? And we make another step, we do it again, and so on. So this ideally works better than if you're just doing standard momentum. And why does it work better, or why is it supposedly work better, is because we're computing the gradient already at this look ahead step. Um, if I'm quickly going back here, another interesting question to consider here is, what about the compute time? Like how fast and how slow is that? Well, does it actually come at an overhead in terms of computational cost, right? Like what's the overhead of this function here, computationally speaking? Um, well, we know that V, as well as theta is, is number of parameters, right? It's the dimension of the parameters, both is vector valued. Um, and, and doing this update step here requires a for loop over a thousand parameters, right? Um, it's a thousand floating point operations. It's not nothing. Um, but if you're comparing that to the gradient computation itself, this is a very, very small value because here's a, here's a thing like go over layers. There's another factor of let's say a hundred, a hundred times number of parameters, right? So this is basically, it's like less than a percent probably that you have an overhead here. Um, so this is something that I should mention, right? Like doing these tricks, all the compute goes in here. So all of the, com the tricks here around it, they're virtually free, right? They don't cost you a lot of, uh, a lot of compute effort. Um, so the only thing kind of that matters now is, is it useful kind of to do this look ahead step? And again, for many cases, this makes sense. Um, it's not always better, but there's many cases where it is actually better. Okay, um, so that is nice. So with momentum, what we have been doing is we exploited the fact that, and with all, and again, there's many, many more variations. I've just shown you two right now. Um, with these variations of, of, of momentum, the idea is always the same. The idea is if a gradient points to the same direction, build up some velocity and go faster if the gradient always points in the same direction. And that, that's a thing that is very useful, right? Because then you don't have to do so many steps. You just build it up over time. There's a bit of a risk that you're overshooting, right? If you build up too much velocity, you can't break anymore in time. So that's a problem, right? Then you have, this is basically what this beta controls, like this friction, like when you allow the current gradient again to kick in to make sure, oh, okay, we went, we went too far. Um, but if you're looking again at our, at our visualization, there's one thing we haven't addressed yet. So, we accumulate in the directions when the gradient always points in the same direction. But there's another issue, which is when we have this chittering, the other option is we can just say, oh, if the gradients point in opposite directions, please don't go so uh, fast, like dampen it a little bit. And this is the idea of um, root mean squared prop, RMS prop. RMS prop, the idea here is that we want to divide the learning rate by an exponentially decaying average of the squared gradients. In other words, if we're having fluctuations, don't go so fast in these directions. Dampen a little bit if there's fluctuations. Um, how do we estimate the fluctuations? Well, I mean, we can quickly say why it makes sense, right? Of course, if you're going up and down here all the time, uh, it's pretty, use pretty useless, right? Because we have to go to the right to the optimum here. We don't have to go up and down. Um, and the idea now is what we do is we have um, in our mess prop, we have this estimate here it's the, the, the element wise, this is an element wise multiplication of the gradient entry. So it computes the squared entries here. Um, and it sums up 
the square space, so it computes on this exponentially weighted squared average of the gradients. So in other words, what that means is this exponentially squared average, um, which we're computing here right now between the previous one and the current one, right? This is just similar to what velocity was before. Now we have this with the squared values. Um, the idea here is, of course, the squares, this grows quadratically, meaning that we have, if you have a big outlier value, um, that will become the dominant factor in this equation here, right? If you have a big outlier value, that would be a problem. And what we do then is we're taking this element-wise squared and we're simply scaling the gradient with respect to it. Um, this one here is also a, a per uh, an element-wise operator, by the way. This one is element-wise because this is a vector, this is an element-wise version. Uh, so we're scaling the gradients uh, component-wise by the square root of this exponential uh, mean squared average. Right? And the idea then is, well, if we have outliers, we are, we are dampening it down. If we have like variation there that is high, we're dampening it down. Um, we have a little bit of an epsilon here. We don't want to divide by zero accidentally. If there's no variation, right? If this one was actually zero, uh, then we would say, oh, oh, look, divide by zero, then go very quickly. But yeah, we have some, we have some uh, fallback that this is not happening. So in this case, we have three hyperparameters. We have alpha, beta, and epsilon. Alpha is still complicated. That's just the thing that's going to be a reoccurring pattern. Beta we set to 0.3 similar to the velocity, but in this case, yeah, it's also, it's like this friction basically um, of, of the square dampening factor here. Um, and, and epsilon is set to 10 to the power of minus eight. This is also just pretty arbitrary. This is just what people do. Okay, but the idea here is that, what do we do here? <laughs> um, I wanted to quickly iterate this idea of these, using these squares here, right? Because we're dividing by the sum of squares Okay, dividing by the exponential sum, exponentially average sum of squares of the gradients. So what that means is if the gradients here are pretty high, right, um, then we will, we, since we're dividing by the square gradients, in y direction, we have large gradients. So we will divide the y direction with a very large value. And the x direction, we will divide with a smaller value because the gradients here will not be so high, right? So large gradients in y, small gradients in x. And that means y will be divided by a disproportionately larger value than x because it's a quadratic function. That's the idea of a quadratic function. If this was a linear version, then it wouldn't matter. Then we would just do the same thing. Um, but since it's a quadratic function, that means the larger values, the larger gradient values will be penalized more will be dampened more than the smaller gradient values. Um, well, you might already see it, right? Because we're using a mean square here. Uh, we, we already see this is basically um, the unsended variance of the gradients, right? And this is actually the second momentum. So in other words, what do we compute? Well, we're computing is um, how noisy are the gradients, right? This is what the square value is doing. If we have large, large gradients here, um, then we have uh, we have a high variance. High variance means then this is what we're doing. It's uncentered. Um, this is a thing we don't do here. Um, but in other words, we're just figuring out, well, if we have no noise and we always point in the same direction, we accumulate gradients. Um, we just do the same thing. Um, so we don't accumulate. We just, we just don't do anything. Uh, if we have high variance, we just dampen the gradients. And why is that useful? Well, the biggest problem what we had is finding a good learning rate, right? And the problem we had to find this conservative, small learning rate that doesn't diverge. But now since we're dampening the large gradient directions and we can estimate how large they are based on, you know, based on the variance, uh, we can simply increase the overall learning rate. So RMS prop allows you to dampen high variance gradients directions. Because of that, it allows you to increase the learning rate. Yeah. So yeah, we dampen the oscillations here for high variance directions, um, and we can use faster learning rates because it is less likely to diverge, which means we speed up the learning by quite a bit. Um, and this is the second momentum, right? Of course, like the first momentum we had before, now we have the second momentum. Um, 
So now we have two different ideas, right? We had the momentum, the first momentum, which is accelerating the direction where the gradient is always going, you're building up this velocity. And we had the idea of the second momentum, um, where we're saying, oh, if you have too high fluctuations, please dampen a little bit. And well, what can we do now? We have two good ideas. Uh, we want to combine these two ideas. We want to just have a method that does both at the same time. We want to build momentum in directions where the gradient is always the same. And we want to dampen things where gradients fluctuate, where we have variance. Um, and this is what adaptive moment, esti uh, moment estimation is doing, Adam. And um, this is something you should, you should uh, pay attention to because Adam is probably one of the standard solvers that everybody's using today. Um, and the idea is we're combining these two things, right? We're combining momentum and RMS prop. So we have two terms in atoms. We have this term and that term. Uh, let's take a look at the first term. This is m here. mk plus one is equal to beta one times mk plus one minus beta one times the gradient. And we know that this is just the exponential moving average of the gradients, right? This is like what we had in momentum. We just say, take the gradient, um, add it to the previous gradient with some sort of uh, linear weighting factor, right? This here is, is the mean of the gradients, right? It's this velocity that we're building up. Um, and the second thing we have also seen, this, is, this li line here is what we had in RMS prop, right? This is the second momentum, it's the variance of the gradients. Um, this is this, again, this element wise squared. Um, just for, for, for writing it down, right, we have here m is the first momentum and v is the second momentum. This is the mean of the gradients and this is the variance of the gradients. It's the definition of first and second momentum. And what we do then is we're just combining these two terms. So we have uh, theta k minus learning rate times this one here is times the first momentum, right? So we're building up, we're using the built up gradients over time and we're dampening it based on the second momentum. And we have this epsilon, so we don't divide by zero. And this combines the two nice ideas. First, we're using the built up gradients. Second, we dampen in high variance directions, which is nice. Um, there's one small thing that I haven't mentioned. This is basically the idea of Adam. It's not quite there yet. Um, what happens at k equals to zero? Basically at the beginning, um, when, when this is zero and this is zero here, right? So like the other words, like our estimates at the very beginning are pretty bad, right? This is, this is indeed a problem, right? Basically when this one is zero and this one is zero. Um, so we need a bias correction of the estimates around zero here, right? And this is because, because of that, this is not quite the Adam update rule. So what we need to do now is we need to do this mean centered, um, uh, yeah, correction because MK and VK are initialized with zero. There's a bias towards zero. Um, so now we need to bias correct the momentum and this is what the, the update rules of Adam is doing, right? So the mean update is basically M hat K plus one uh, is MK plus one divided by one minus the beta, right? Uh, and the same for, for the Vs, right? And then what we do is we're taking the mean corrected versions of M and V. That, that's the only difference. But again, this is just because, well, our estimates at the beginning are pretty bad, right? If, if we could have good estimates, we wouldn't have to do this mean-centered uh, bias correction. Okay. Um, but yeah, the, the high-level idea, again, for Adam is we have this exponential decaying mean and the exponential decaying variance of the gradients. We're combining the first and the second order momentum. Um, we have a couple of more hyperparameters. We have alpha, beta one, beta two, and epsilon. And we have these update steps here, right? So we have, we're computing mk plus one. It's the, uh, yeah, the mean of the gradients. We have the mean of the squared gradients. And we have this bias correction. And then we have the update step. Now, these hyperparameters here, Beta 1 is typically set to 0.9, beta 2 is typically set to 0.99, epsilon is typically point, uh, set to uh, 10 to the power of minus 8. Um, by typically, I mean these are the default parameters in PyTorch. This is just, PyTorch is, a, is one of the frameworks uh, we're obviously using for a lot of things. Um, if you don't, well, in practice you just don't have to change these ones. These ones are pretty good. Um, alpha needs tuning. Yeah, so this is default in PyTorch, this one needs tuning. Um, yeah, don't, don't change these ones if you don't have to, but you have to still be aware of what they're actually doing. It depends a little bit on the problem. Sometimes when you have more complicated networks, it might still make sense to change it. Um, but for the most cases, um, and for this lecture, we typically don't have to. Okay. Um, there are 
a couple of other methods. There are actually many other methods. All of these methods are still in the family of, of stochastic gradient descent. All of these are SGD variations. Um, but there's different ways of how to, you know, accumulate things, gradients over time, how to leverage uh, certain things over time and so on. So um, we've heard about vanilla SGD, we heard about momentum, we heard about RMS probe. There's things like add a grad, add a delta, add a max, nada, a mass grad and so on. There's actually many, many more. Um, they're very easy to do, right? Because you just have to figure out how to update the gradients, but they all have a fundamental meaning. There's also some proofs that, oh, this one converges in these situations and so on. Um, it is a lot of fun to play around with that because like changing these things make a huge difference. In practice, um, people use Adam today. This is just the default thing. If you don't know what, what's going on, um, if you don't know the problem well enough, all this is Adam. It's a, Adam standard hyperparameters, figure out the learning rate. Learning rate you have to still figure out, but otherwise you always use Adam. Um, yeah, I mentioned this makes a big difference. Um, I wanted to show a couple of plots here. Um, this is a, a, an animation of an energy landscape here. You see here different optimizers, SGD, Momentum, NAC, Adagrad, Delta, LMS Pro. It doesn't have Adam here, but it has a couple of different ones. And you see how quickly they converge. Optimum is supposed to be here. Here's our starting point, right? So if you're taking the red one, this, this SGD, this poor SGD one, is just doing a constant step size and it's always trying to get there, but it's so slow because it doesn't accumulate any gradients. If you're using standard momentum, the green one, green one is pretty good, look at this, but it overshoots quite massively at the beginning, and it overshoots here a little bit again and so on. That's like, you could balance this out with different betas, but, but yeah, momentum is overshooting a little bit. The other one's doing a little bit better, like RMS probe I think is doing pretty well. I mean, RMS probably is not overshooting, but it also takes a little bit longer to just make make step forward. So, that, yeah. Um, we have other cases like these ones. This is a very important one. This is kind of the settle point here, right? You have high gradients in these directions, but low gradients in these directions. Um, and it depends a little bit on the numerics. So you still have to consider we're dealing with floating point values, but a lot of these optimizers they get stuck in these settle points, right? Um, the red one here, it's just SGD, it just doesn't get out, it just doesn't build up any momentum. Um, whereas the other ones, like, you know, the, the, the green one is kind of funny, it goes all this back and forth, and it takes a long time, and then it accelerates. And the other ones, like RMS Pro and so on, they're doing a little bit better here. Um, okay, but you see, like, in an energy landscape like this one, it makes a huge difference what optimizer you're using, and how to update the gradients. Okay, I have another example here. Um, yeah, this one does have to have Adam. The red one here is Adam. Uh, again, starting point here. One optimum here, one optimum here. Here we see also the optimizer makes a huge difference in which optimum you're running. Oh, there's actually three. One, two, three. Local minima, right? The green one here is Adagrad ends up here. Adam ends up here relatively quickly. Um, yeah, and so on. Um, and yeah, again, the thing what I wanted to mention here is like the choice of the optimization makes a huge, huge difference depending on the problem. And this is something you should really be aware of depending on what you're optimizing for. Good. So I think, um, I hope this gives you a little bit of, a, of, an, of, a, of an introduction of what SGD is and what the variations are. I wanted to quickly scale back a little bit and give you a bit of background generally for optimizations. Um, so we've been discussing a lot of concepts right now, what are derivatives, gradients, Jacobians, and so on, and Hessians. You should know these things, right? Um, and I believe you do um, from your analysis classes. I mean, derivatives we've been talked about for quite a while. Gradients is the vector of all the partial derivatives. Um, the Jacobians is every partial derivative with respect to a residual. Uh, and the Hessians um, is then the second derivatives and M here is the number of parameters. So Hessian is number of uh, weights you're optimizing for squared, right? Um, in a lot of optimization schemes, people look at Jacobians and Hessians, especially at the Hessians because the Hessians are second order derivatives. And this is a thing that gradient descent doesn't do. Gradient descent just use the gradient, right? Of course, that's how it goes. Um, but a very important optimization method, like Newton's method, they actually use a second order Taylor expansion to approximate the function, right? So what you're doing is you have a function, the loss function here, you can approximate it by like uh, a second order Taylor expansion, 0, 1, 2, right? Constant term, gradient, second order term, like this first derivative gradient, 
this is the second order derivative, it's curvature, it's basically the Hessian, right? Um, and if you're comparing it, the SGD would only do um, this one here. Um, and the difference here is if you're using this Taylor expansion here, uh, we can reformulate it. And what we want to do is we want to find the, well, we simply want to go ahead and set this equation to zero. If we're setting this equation to zero, we're ending up with this update step, which is update step is equal to initialization of theta minus the inverse Hessian times the gradient. And the difference here is in Newton's method, the Hessian kind of replaced learning rate. It's also not just, oh, we, we find a good learning rate and a fixed scalar, but actually we have this Hessian function based on the curvature, we are scaling the gradient across every parameter dimension, right? Um, and this is something that works surprisingly well. Uh, and many, many optimization methods in like computer vision and so on are using Newton's method or variations of Newton's method. And the reason why I'm mentioning it is, in principle, a second order uh, optimizer is doing much better than a gradient optimizer, right? This is one thing you should learn out of this class too. I mean, understand that everybody in neural networks uses gradient descent. This is born out of pure practicality, which I'll go over in a second because of the number of parameters. Um, but Newton's method is very, very good for many other problems, right? And if we're having a, a, a network um, with a few K million parameters, this Hessian here will be K squared, right? This is pretty big. And the computer computational effort um, of quote unquote iter, iter, uh, inverting the Hessian is actually K cubed. Oh, by the way, little side note, if you're solving this one, you would never ever invert a matrix like that. You would always solve a linear system. So you bring this guy here. So you, you, you just bring this one to the right-hand side, this one to the left, sorry, this one to the left-hand side, this one to the right-hand side. Um, you're multiplying with the Hessian um, and you would solve a linear system. You're never gonna invert a matrix like that if it's so big. Um, that's just not something you do because it's numerically considered to be unstable. Well, it is unstable. Um, yeah, so I mentioned it. So if we are comparing gradient descent versus Newton's method, the gradient descent here is in green. It just goes along the gradient direction. Newton's method considers the curvature of these functions here, which goes a much, much more direct route. So we need, well, we have to compute the Hessian or we have, we have to uh, solve this linear system to, to avoid the inversion. Um, but the problem basically is, well, the good thing is we need fewer steps in Newton, but every step is a bit more costly. Um, but I can tell you like how many steps we have to do um, depends on the problem statement. Um, in a very specific case is, if we're applying Newton's method for linear regression, what do you get as a result? Well, this is a least squares problem. And if there's a linear least squares problem, which we have in linear uh, regression, Newton's method would actually give you an answer in a single step. Um, why? Well, we, we're approximating the function um, with a second order Taylor expansion. And the second order Taylor expansion is a quadratic uh, since it's a quadratic function, right, we can perfectly approximate it. This is why Newton's method will converge into one step. Um, there's a few variations of, of Newton's method, um, and one variation specifically, uh, well, many variations or line of research is, like these quasi-Newton methods, they want to get rid of the inverse of the Hessian, or the Hessian to begin with. There's, there's a way you want to get rid of the Hessian and approximate it. Uh, one, one method that is very, very popular is BFGS and LBFGS. Um, BFGS stands for Broyden, Fletcher, Goldfarb, and Channel algorithm. Um, this is a quasi-Newton method and they just approximate the inverse Hessian. Um, it's typically a low rank approximation and there's various ways how to do that. Um, BFGS is only n squared um, uh, in terms of memory. Is, sorry, BFGS is n squared in memory. So you still store the full Hessian here, which like if you have millions of parameters, is not, not, not practical. LBFGS is using a low rank approximation of that that one is using only, uh, can, can be in linear storage, right? A lot of people in practice use LBFGS methods. LBFGS is a very, very popular method. Um, the other important approximations what people can do for the Hessians is Gauss-Newton. So the Gauss-Newton method is saying, well, because we, again, Hessian is complicated to obtain, we approximate the Hessian with two times JTJ, two times the Jacobian transpose times the Jacobian. Uh, and then, yeah, you, you're trying to have instead of the Hessian, you have two times JTJ here, times the gradient to update. Um, 
And again, you would solve this linear system. Here it's actually like, this is what I meant by linear system. Instead of solving this inverse here, what you do is you bring uh, this guy here to the other side by multiplying with this one through, right? Okay, there's a few variations, of course, Newton actually. Um, there's Levenberg's method. Levenberg's method says, oh, it's a dampened version of course, Newton. So here we have JTJ times lambda times identity. So you're just having a regularization factor here. Um, it's called Tiganov regularization. Uh, many people do this with the damning factor. It says, um, basically it tells you um, to, to interpolate between Gauss-Newton and gradient descent. If I have a, if, if, if alpha, uh, if lambda is zero, we're doing uh, Gauss-Newton. If large, it's more or less doing what gradient descent is doing. In the second thing, what Levenberg's method is doing, um, it's checking after every step if the function value went down. So if my updated value, my energy value needs to be smaller, if that wasn't the case, I'm going to change this lambda, right? Um, ideally, I want to have, um, ideally, I want to do Gauss Newton, but maybe if I'm overshooting too much, right, um, I have this trust region, I, I'm going to make it larger, uh, regularizing more, basically, right? Um, there's another version of Levenberg, it's called Levenberg Marquardt, LM optimizer, you might have heard that, that's also a very popular optimizer. And the idea is instead of having the identity matrix here, you take the diagonal of JTJ for regularization. Um, yeah, inst inst instead of a plain gradient descent now uh, for large alpha, we scale each component of the gradient according, according to the curvature. And this is the diagonal here. Um, yeah, this basically avoids low convergence in components with small gradients because that, um, that is better than, than standard Levenberg. So if you're using this, you would, uh, would use Levenberg Marquardt instead of Levenberg. That's typically what people do. Um, the big question is, why am I telling you all of this? <laughs> um, and I already mentioned which optimizer do we use when. Um, the standard optimizer is Adam. That's something I already mentioned. Um, the fallback option is SGD with momentum. Um, these are what we use for neural networks. Newton's method, LBFTS, Gauss-Newton, and lambert marquardt Again, people rarely use Lambert. Mostly it's lambert marquardt um, You can only do this for full... Um, this, this only uh, you can do pretty well for, uh, for full updates because the estimates of the Hessians here, <laughs> they don't work so well for mini batches. And this is one of the reasons why they don't use it for, for that. However, in many other deep learning, uh, sorry, many other non-deep learning versions of machine learning, these are very common optimizers. And that's why I'm telling you about it. So I want you to go out of this class and know, you know, based on the problem, what optimizer you should use. I mean, I told you a lot of variations of SGD now, um, but I also want to make sure there's a lot of other optimizers that are also gradient based, higher order gradient based possibly that could work better. Theoretically, it would give you better convergence, but we haven't fully, the community hasn't fully figured out how to leverage the mini batch concept for these optimizers. Um, and this is something, you know, it probably will require more research, and maybe you are one of them who provides um, a better solution um, for these methods and gets better convergence. So that would be obviously very interesting. Um, so, yeah, the reason why I'm mentioning it again in many other computer vision methods, these are standard optimizers. And this is just, if you don't know these ones, um, I know these are not going to be the core focus of this class, but if these things what I just told you are new, I would highly recommend look these ones up, um, check how they how they work. This is just super super important if you want to, you know, do something in computer vision and machine learning. You you need to know these these methods how they work, and you need to know when to use them. Yeah, if you're talking about channel optimization, I, I just wanted to go quickly another another level higher in the abstractions, right? So we have now linear optimization, nonlinear optimization, and then we have other optimization schemes. So if you're solving linear, so this is what we just talked about, linear gradient-based optimizations, um, Newton, Gauss, Newton, LM, LBFGS. These are second order methods. You have gradient descent, SGD versions, right? They're all first order methods. Um, yeah, the linear systems, this is also something you should look up. Um, there's LU decomposition, QR decomposition, Cholesky decomposition. These ones are factorization based optimizers. Um, they take a systems matrix, you factorize it, and then you substitute typically, right? Then you have iterative linear solvers like Jacobic or Seidel, uh, conjugate gradient, uh, preconditioned conjugate gradient, and stuff like that. Um, 
Again, if you don't know these terms, look them up. This is something you have to know in machine learning. You have to look up how linear systems work. Um, and again, the reason why I am uh, telling you that is it really depends on the problem what optimizer you need. Like we have seen how big the differences can be for, for neural networks. And I want to make sure that when somebody asks you in a job interview or so, what is your optimizer you're going to use? It's not always gradient descent. Gradient descent is only one optimizer that works particularly well for neural networks. But there's many other optimization methods. Um, despite the gradient-based optimization here, we have many other optimization methods. Um, you might have heard about genetic algorithms, right? Um, it's, it's a nonlinear solver, but it is not gradient-based. We have um, MCMC and Metropolis Hastings. These are kind of stochastic optimizers that also work based on samples and distributions, but they're not gradient-based. You make basically proposals, check if they got better and so on. Um, there's also constraint beta optimization, like um, ADMM is a very popular one, Lagrange optimizers, primal dual and so on. Um, super relevant for many problem statements. Again, not so relevant yet in the context of neural networks, but they might be at some point. Like if you want to do research in neural networks and machine learning, you should understand what optimizers mathema mathematicians have been developed over the last centuries. Okay. Um, yeah, I would like you to um, really think about the problem and the optimization tools you have at hand. I think this is very, 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 very important. Um, STD is specifically designed for mini batches. This is why it works so well, and this is also why people are using it. If you can use a second order solver, please do so. Again, for many computer vision problems like SLAM, tracking, reconstruction, you always see second order solvers being used because they're just much faster. Um, and a very important lesson here, gradient descent is not a way to solve a linear system. I've, I've heard this so many times say, and please, if you're taking this class, make sure you memorize gradient descent is used for nonlinear optimization problems, right? It's a gradient based solver. We've seen sometimes it converges <coughs> to the right local minima, uh, to the global minima when it's convex. Otherwise it, you can guarantee that and so on. But please make sure you, you understand that linear systems are not being solved with gradient descent, right? Okay, but this is still very good. Um, yeah, this week we we went again over optimization. Um, next lecture, we're gonna continue with training neural networks. Um, there's still a few tricks we have to go over. Um, but now you already know quite some stuff, right? You know, there are neural networks, you can compute gradients, you can do backpropagation, um, you can take training set, you can compute the gradient with respect to training set, you can do mini batches. Um, yeah, and we will continue next week with that. Um, again, yeah, um, I hope the exercises meant okay. Um, there will be more updates, of course. Uh, check the office hours if you have any questions, especially if you have questions to the lecture. Um, uh, let us know on Moodle if there's anything we can do to help you. Yeah, otherwise, um, see you next week. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, um, and hopefully you're enjoying the deep learning area as much as I do. So thanks a lot. See you next week.